within the project that we've been working on, we've always had a very clear view that there is only one reason to teach something to be done by hand. It's either because it's conceptually empowering or because it's the only way to do it, that the computers can't, can't yet do it. But perhaps the panelists that we have here will disagree with that. So let me introduce the panel that, uh, that we have today. Um, we have uh, Joel Afgang, who trained as a physicist, but is now a software developer, and he works on uh, calculus courseware for making math. We have Bruce Carpenter at the end from the University of Illinois. Originally an, an electrical engineer, Bruce has been involved in calculus and Mathematica projects since 1989, which is pretty much the beginning, I would say, is that right? Kim Hu Hang, to my left, uh, is a professional mathematician, but who's for many years, uh, has many years' experience as both a school math teacher and curriculum advisor, and is currently head of a school in Singapore. And at the end, uh, we have David Wees, also an experienced school math teacher, having taught in New York, Vancouver, Bangkok, and right here in London, and he now specializes in learning technologies. So I'm hoping through the session you'll be able to throw up some borderline cases or interesting things that we can talk about, whether they should or shouldn't be taught by hand. But I want to kick off by uh, just going down the line and asking our panelists to suggest something that is hand calculating that they would like to kick out of hand calculating or something that they'd like to protect that they think is important to keep hand calculating or to disagree with my original statement. Bruce. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as he indicated, I've been involved in the Calculus and Mathematica project since 1989, the very beginning. And I've taught computer-based math for you know, all, the, all those years. And one of the things I think is really important to understand is that if you think about mathematics and the levels of abstraction, at the very lowest level, you have the syntactic, something driven by formulas, a y of t equals something. And it's very easy to trap students at that level, where they think that mathematics is just transformation of these syntactic formulas. But as you go up the levels of abstraction, the very next level is a description, where you actually say the words y of t equals. And if you're dealing with exponentials, you don't say e to the minus 2t. You would say that y of t involves a sum of exponentials. So that's a level of description that lies above that. And there are many levels that go up. And so the danger of, of hand calculation, or emphasis on hand calculation alone, is that if you trap students at that level and they never make essential connections, then when they actually need to apply those formulas, they don't have a description that they can reach for that will prompt the use of a particular formula. So, and I've been struggling with this for 20 years, and, and I'm a mathematician and an engineer, so I have arrogance in two different areas. <laughs> and I don't think that I have, well, actually more than that, but we'll go with that. I don't think that I have all the answers, but I think I've started to put my finger on what the essential questions are. And I think that the difficulty with using computer-based math alone is that it lies beyond human scale. When we want to see something that's very, very small, we apply a microscope to it that brings it to human scale. If we want to see you know, galaxies far, far away, we use telescopes to bring it to human scale. When the computer does all the calculations, it, it does them so fast and it does them so extensively that it lies beyond human scale. So the real trick, the balancing point, is how can we bring the calculations to a human scale? And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it by hand. It just means that you have to have some experience with the smaller types of calculations so that you can understand and manage the larger calculations. And that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, through a great amount of repetition of hand calculations. I'll say more later. <laughs> um, all right, well, I, I want to start off by saying that, um, first of all, I'm, not, I'm the only person on this panel who's not actually an educator. Um, I'm a software developer. I, um, I've been working in uh, building platforms for teaching mathematics online, so uh, I'm a little biased uh, in this case. Um, but to me, my first reaction when I was even posed this question was it seems like a strange question to even be asking in 2011. Um, I, I can't imagine um, a conference of journalists having a debate today asking the question, typewriters or word processors? Um, or accountants asking, you know, should we be have using you know, teaching how to stack, you know, add up stacks of numbers in a general ledger where you're filling out with like pen and paper, or should we be using computer-based, you know, accounting systems, um, or even teaching those skills to students? Um, 
you know, where, where I would draw the line is, I mean, I think people need math in their everyday life when they're just, you know, in a, in a shop, you know, basic addition. I think young kids need to be able to do addition without a calculator, you know. But I think anything beyond that really is amenable to having an enhanced, you know, understanding of things through the help of computers. Um, really, the only type of math that you need to know to do yourself without a computer is the kind of math that you're going to be expected to do in the real world where you won't be able to have a computer to help you do it. Um, other than that, it's just, um, I don't know, to me it just seems that it's, um, it's an exercise in just doing an exercise for the sake of it rather than for practical sake of actually learning useful skills. Because, right, I mean, we've, we've, this was discussed yesterday, you know, it, it, once you leave the academic world and start working as an engineer or in finance, um, you're using computers all the time. Um, you know, the example that was given yesterday, um, I'm sorry, I forget the gentleman's name, who was uh, sort of more opposed to using computers because he was saying how, um, you know, he's taught students, but then when they, they, they leave that environment um, and um, they're in the finance world and they, they're, they're, they have a new problem to solve, you know, they go asking around for a spreadsheet to copy um, of somebody else where they can just fill in their own numbers because they can't do that themselves. Um, and that was used as an argument for, um, you know, they need to be taught how to do these things by hand. But the, why teach them how to do things by hand so that they, they can then use spreadsheets? It seems to me that the tool that they're being, that they're using is a spreadsheet, right? That's so, I mean, in that environment, in the financial world, the spreadsheet is, you know, it's the tool of choice. They're not using Mathematica, per se, at least in, in that area, that level. So what they should be being taught is how to build a spreadsheet. Right? How to take, you know, start off by giving them a, a, you know, a filled out spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers in it, and then, you know, as an exercise, give them a partially filled out spreadsheet that has, you know, that doesn't quite, you know, lay out the information or present it the way it is, and then give them a blank spreadsheet with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of data to bring in so they can actually learn the skills that they're going to be using and working the way that they're going to be working. So to me, that just, you know. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Come here. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm actually a school, school principal of NUS High School of Maths and Science. It's a very specialized independent school that uh, craft, is, and craft and design its own curriculum. Our students do not, it's not required to sit for any national exams and they will graduate with a diploma. So actually, uh, from our experience, we have um, a space to, to really design something that fits and serves our students' needs. Now, however, I have to share that uh, I, I, from yesterday's discussion, I would like to highlight two areas which I think very few people have uh, highlighted. Um, we are not constrained by national curriculum, but we are constrained by where our students are going to. So we have to consider the qualification that will meet the requirement of the universities. And I think uh, I'm aware that uh, my son is studying un maths at university and he was uh, sharing with me that at the place where he, he is currently in, uh, in exams, they are still required to re reproduce proof of some theorems. I mean, I was asking myself why this need to be done. But the question that comes to my mind is what about the university level kind of education, uh, the teaching of mathematics at university, because this will have bearing on what needs to be mastered and taught at the high school level. Now, let me uh, also give you um, some examples from yesterday's discussion about where to draw the line. So I'll go in. Uh, these are examples that I have actually come across through my work in the last 30 years. Uh, I was a curriculum uh, specialist at our Ministry of Education in the 1990s. And I remember uh, there was a stage when we were reviewing our curriculum and I, if you, many of you remember, we were discussing whether we should require students to remember the multiplication timetable. Well, we know that if they can't remember anything and multiplication is only repeated addition all the time, they can't live life efficiently. So we arbitrarily tell the school teachers, well, get the students to remember through some constructive approach and they can remember up to 12 by 12. But why 12 by 12? Because that was what all of us were brought up with. Mm -hmm. And they must be able to do it very quickly. So, and what about addition? 
we must be able to add and remember very quickly 9 plus 9, up to 9 plus 9, single digit. And everything else, something else will come, come on. This is one example. A second example I would like to highlight. Now, by the way, I was also involved in the International Maths Olympiad training in my country in the 1990s. I was part of the national team trainer. So I'll give you some thoughts at the other extreme. I think uh, some of us are aware that, you know, uh, for geometry questions at the IMO, students are not allowed to use the construction sets into the examination. So my question, I, I, I've been asking myself, why is that so? Is there something that students need to have to do geometry without the help of technology? But if we allow that technology, I think uh, if that problem, that problem become more accessible to many more students who can tackle those questions. So I'm talking about the accessibility here. Um, another example I'll go back to the primary school level will be, will be this. And this is something I encountered recently when I had a discussion with my vice principal. Um, we were asking a question in my school, it's a math and science school, what's the ratio of uh, girls to the boys? And my vice principal is a one to two. And I say, no, let me do a quick calculation. And I say, no, it's four to seven. So <laughs> I take the joy out of you know, realizing that the four to seven is more accurate than four to eight. Now that's where the line is, that's the difference between someone who just want to use mathematics and someone who derives joy from to be accurate because we know that four divided by four seven is actually closer to the actual exact ratio. So someone who's actually required to just an estimate and someone who wants to go for precision. All right. Another example that I want to bring up is I think some examples where I related to mathematics where I think they have long uh, disappeared. I think many of us remember the slide rules and logarithm tables and how to use them. But I think with the calculator, none of us f uh, feel that there's a loss. So are there areas in mathematics where we can give up? Like the ability to use the logarithm tables and, and the slide rules. Um, I, I was in the Navy many years ago uh, as a sailor because in Singapore we are required to serve this compulsory military service. And I remember in the 1970s, I was out at sea and we have to use the star fixed and we have to learn astro navigation. And I remember having to memorize the procedure to use all the almanacs to do various calculations to finally get a figure to get a fix without understanding what's behind all those amenities and tables. But since then, um, we have uh, satellite navigation, and I can't remember anybody using those amenities now. But what I fear most would be if one day all satellite uh, stations don't get work and you are see what do you do. All right? Um, Last but not least, I, let me just, I have a main example, I'll just highlight this example where we actually have our students doing, and that's related to differentiation, and using differentiation to uh, apply to maximum and minimum problems. In the textbooks, most of these problems are easily differentiable, and you can actually solve the derivatives. But quite often in real life, uh, if you, even if it's a very simplified problem, all right, uh, Quite often, the first derivative comes in the form of square roots and some third form where solution of these uh, problems are not possible by hand and they need to be approximated and, and, I be, and the mathematics behind are numerical. And that's where we get our students to use, use the handheld calculator with computer algebra system to work out solution. Now the question here is, should we allow students to solve some of these problems to appreciate the real life nature without needing to know the numerical mathematics at that point of time, but to, to, get, to get to know how to do them or to learn them later. Is, uh, are you um, a lot suggesting that trying some 
at the beginning is a, a bit like Bruce's idea of a human scale problem. Right. And then you get the telescope. Correct. Right. So we have actually experienced this. And I find that it's very useful because for those who do not want to be mathematicians, they do appreciate these examples because the, the examples, the, the, the problems are very real and not so unreal. Like they are always quadratic, they are always polynomials. When in real life, they are not exactly Thank you. like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I just wanted to say that um, I like doing the by-hand examples because it really sort of encourages children to bring their calculators. <laughs> um, so, so the first thing I wanted to point out is that I think that, that we have in some sense, um, at least in K-12 schools, put calculus at the top of the heap and sort of everything aims for calculus. And I think that, um, that I would prefer not to backwards design from a system where 50% of students fail at the first year of university. <laughs> I don't think that that's a good system, so I don't feel like we should necessarily, if we were proposing an ideal system, backwards design from a poor system. Um, so I would propose that one of the things we need to do is to encourage quite a wider variety of mathematics to be taught. Um, I mean, virtually anything that we can get to be accessible, and certainly that's one of the advantages of computer-based math, that some of these computations are uh, much more accessible to lower grades. The second thing is that I think that regardless of whether people use paper, they use computers or calculators, that if they don't understand what they're doing, that it is just meaningless recipes that they're following. And so that uh, wherever we draw the line, we sort of have to decide um, about whether we need understanding or whether we want people who are just can do follow recipes. And I think that we probably in this room would agree we'd prefer understanding in the, in the long run. So then the question is, what does understanding mean? And I think one, uh, maybe we can't understand what's, we can't know what's going inside our students' heads, but we can sort of see whether or not they can predict outcomes of algorithms. So for example, students who are given multiplication questions who can then sort of say, well, I think the answer is going to be about this, and then do the multiplication question, get an exact answer, go, right, yeah, I was right. That the, if you cannot predict the outcome of what you're attempting to do, if you have no sense of what you're going to produce, that you really can't be said to understand whatever it is you're looking at. So I think that we have to sort of focus more on understanding and this ability to predict outcomes of what, of what they're actually working on. And this is sort of a way for us as teachers to see whether or not, uh, to sort of peer into our students' brains and see if they do actually have some understanding of what they're doing when they're using the um, computer-based math systems. Um, and I think that we also want some control from the user that um, one of the advantages of the paper-based systems is that the person is in control of each step of the output, that they are doing the manipulation on paper and they're producing something, they can sort of own it. And that, um, that I would like that same thing to still happen when they're working with the computer algebra systems, with the computerized math systems. Uh, I had a, a friend, this is sort of um, an anecdote that I think is useful to describe. He's an oceanographer. And I asked him if he did any math in his, job, in his work. And he said, no, I don't do any math. The computer does it for me. And I said, well, how does that happen? And he says, well, uh, here's an example. I had these, these three measurement stations. And I had to figure out uh, whether all three were necessary. So I constructed a model that might describe the three measurement stations. And that produced a, a series of differential, partial differential equations, which you know, I didn't want to bother trying to solve by hand. So I put them into my computer, it produced a numerical result. I then took that and graphed it and analyzed it and determined that, that one of the, way, the, the third of the three stations was unnecessary because the other two stations described its data with 88% accuracy. I said, oh, so you're not doing any math then. <laughs> so, um, so again, that's, that's him, he's in control of the process, right? Like the, the only step of that process that he's outsourced is the one that one computation step that, that he can't, if, and if he got a, he says that sometimes he gets bad results. And I said, what do you do? Well, I, I look at it and I say, that doesn't make any sense. Right? That obviously doesn't work. So again, he's, he's able to predict the outcomes of what he's producing. He has an, a, a feeling for what's going to happen from this, from this outcome. And I think quite often that we don't see that at the, at the K to 12 level. So then the question is, if, if it takes a certain amount of time to predict an outcome, and you can get the exact answer on paper or in your head, you know, faster than it would take you to produce it on the calculator, then why not just do it straight up? So for example, very simple calculations, you know, they're, they're, the predictability, the sort of step of sort of deciding how close you are to your answer is significant as compared to 
actually doing the calculation. And so in that sense, you should probably just do the calculation. It is probably easier overall. So that we draw the line not based on what our current curriculum says, but we draw the line based on um, A, the educational value of doing the computation by hand, but also B, whether the ability to understand the algorithm uh, is ex actually doing the algorithm. Thank you. So before I go to the floor, let me throw one uh, concrete example um, down to the panel. Uh, my head's full of formulas 25 years on from when I was taught them, and one is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, the solution to the quadratic equation, although it doesn't help with any other equations. Is, is there any value in that, knowing that formula, Bruce? Or formulas like it, for that matter? Yes. Can you oh, explain you, why? <laughs> oh, you want more? Um, well, it's, it's a matter of levels, actually. Um, no matter what profession you go into, you, you operate at a certain level, and every professional needs to know things that lie at a lower level. For example, if you're a chemist, it might be extremely useful to understand something about quantum mechanics and bonding. You don't necessarily want to deal with that all the time, but there are problems where you need to go to that level. And you also need to understand the level that is above your op normal operating level so that you can understand the motivations and things when you're teaching students. You can tell them where things are going. So things like the quadratic formula, which are drilled into students, I say it's important only because the quadratic is at human scale. We don't teach the cubic formula, although there is one. We don't teach the quartic formula, although there is one, because those formulas are actually, for most people, outside human scale. The formulas are so ugly and so hard to understand. Actually, they're quite beautiful. Feel free to investigate them. <laughs> but the quadratic formula must come along with its connections. Where does it come from? Why are the roots given by that formula? If you don't have these, these formulas connected, then when you actually need to reach for them and apply them, they won't be there because all memory is reconstructed on the fly. You don't pull memories off of a shelf. You have this collection, this cloud of ideas. Ooh, there's the cloud idea again. You have this cloud of ideas. And when you need something, your brain basically reconstructs the memory. Our memories are associative. So if you teach things in a very rote fashion and don't connect them in, in, into this web of ideas, then when your brain needs to reconstruct them, it won't have the necessary pieces to come up with it. So yes, they do need to be able to do the hand calculations that are on human scale, because that's where they build those connections. So yes, I think the quadratic formula is important, but not something to just be rotely memorized, connected, because the quadratic idea comes up in lots of places. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, see, I think that something like the quadratic formula, or really, I mean, any other concept, is something that computers can actually help students explore and understand by being able to, I mean, in a textbook, you know, you'll have a whole bunch of math symbols, and then, you know, and, you know have a few plots here and there, but the ability for a student to actually construct their own plots, like, in a, you know, in a, um, be able to put in an equation, an expression, and change, to change things around and modify and see dynamically how the visualization changes and actually choose to be able to control the visualization, you know, and um, allows them to get an under, I mean, that was my experience personally, is, you know, when I was studying physics, I discovered, um, you know, that I had access to uh, Mathematica and Maple, you know, I could log in through a VT100 terminal and, and, and have it help me, you know, do my homework, and you know, at some level, you know, is, you know, is this cheating? You know, um, but I wasn't just doing the problem solving when I was doing that. I was once I got a hold of that stuff, I'd be putting stuff in, and I'd be exploring the math through the computer and doing it in a way that I couldn't have done otherwise. You know, for me, I mean, I, I you know, I'm a visual thinker. I, I you know, I, that's why I studied physics instead of just math because I could relate it to things that I could, you know, objects and you know. And, um, not just symbols on a page. When I was doing calculus as a math class, it was just, to me, it was, you know, symbols. I, I found it harder to do that than when I was doing calculus in a physics class because it was tied to something that I can understand. And, and that's why I loved it when I, could, when I discovered, um, um, you know, computer algebra systems that, I could, help, that I could do these things because um, it was incredibly um, liberating for me. Um, 
And so I think you know anything like that. It's it, there's there's lots of value in being able to use computers to 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 enhance understanding. Thank you. So I'm going to steal the mic back for just a second because I want to respond to something he said that I agree with very much. So I, I was actually helping to teach a course for um, secondary math teachers. And they were talking about the quadratic formula. I was flashing back to this memory. And one of them asked me, um, what do these numbers, what do these symbols mean? So I had her pull up Mathematica and type in, I made her do everything, type in ax squared plus bx plus c and plot that as a function of x. And add manipulators for a, b, and c. And just say, what happens as you change C? It moves up and down. Yeah, yeah. What happens when you change A? Well, if it's positive, it goes like this. And if it's negative, it goes like that. What happens when you change B? <laughs> the parabola itself moves along a parabola. That and the roots of that function, where it crosses the axes, that's what the quadratic formula gives you. So that made a connect, that ability to explore, right, to explore parameter space, and connect it to these formulas, meant that the quadratic formula wasn't just a formula to be memorized, it was connected to the very rich ideas. And she got very excited by that. Does anyone else want to take this one? Yeah, I, was, I have um, um, two stories. One is that I remember in ninth grade, my teacher showed me completing the square. And I went home that night and I took the general case and I proved the quadratic formula for fun. And I remember that. And that's the only thing I remember from ninth grade math. And the, the second thing is when I was uh, starting to teach the quadratic formula, I got curious about when it worked, like when we got real answers. And I looked and I basically wrote a little computer script to go through and try random values of, of B, A, and C and determine when the discriminant was going to be negative. And, you know, it turns out that there's a three and four chance that the uh, the roots of the um, of a quadratic formula, if you choose A, B, and C randomly, are in fact um, you actually end up with uh, real solutions. But then I had to try to prove that, right? So in both these cases, I'm I'm looking at the quadratic formula. I think in in sort of ways that are different than it's intended to be used. I'm using it to explore algebra, to explore using one piece of algebra to prove another piece of algebra. But I'm not actually using the quadratic formula for its its purpose at all. I think that um, it's, it's a mistake to make students to me memorize a bunch of formulas, that it's, it's not realistic. If you look at how people do math, uh, the things they have memorized are the things they use a lot. And the things that they don't have memorized are, are things that just don't come up very often. They have to go and, they, they go and look it up. Uh, I do quite a bit of pro programming, and I quite often will have to look up function calls and I'll have to figure out you know, which API I'm going to be using, et cetera. And I do a lot of referencing and stuff that I use often, I, I keep. So I think that if, if the quadratic formula were something that, that people used often, then yeah, sure, absolutely. They'll memorize it naturally, and I don't need to worry about that. Is anyone concerned that out of uh, all of the infinite polynomials, it's only the orders 1, 2, 3, and 4 that actually even have a formula, that it might be misleading to think that <coughs> formulas are the way to solve equations? That there's a negative to teaching this? I find students are shocked that general formulas don't exist past they find that very interesting. Can I, I should take a question from the audience before we run out of time. Um, do we have somebody with a mic? No. A couple of days ago, I'm from the United States, and a couple of days ago um, in the New York Times, there was an interesting article uh, about the fact that uh, something like 50% of the high school students that go into U U.S. universities, and this is across the board, whether you go to a top flight university or a um, uh, state or college university, 50% um, of students that intended to be STEM majors when they got out of high school quit. And one of the major reasons cited was the tedium of the university curriculum. And I would submit that uh, we do many things wrong in the United States, and we do math about as wrong as anybody. Uh, but there is has been a very healthy movement to use graphing calculators and uh, particularly graphing calculators in the school curriculum in the United States. And American students get to college and the university professors don't make the kids do things by hands. And the kids see that as being punitive 
tedious. That's a gross overgeneralization. Uh, well, well, I'm just saying that the New York Times was a shocking article that appeared, you can look at last week's New York Times, um, uh, the study that was done, and found that actually, so uh, what I'm saying is that it's interesting that this problem, because I think it's the problem that we're grappling with here, perhaps, at least in the U.S., exists more in the university curriculum at this point in terms of the acceptance of technology than at the school curriculum. Okay, can we take another question? Um, um, if you can run up there, there's some at the back up here. Do you want to shout out? Um, just make two points to the um, one is that it is on the formula sheet, um, and so you don't actually need to learn it. Two is, with the calculators that are available nowadays, you, all you need to do is type in the coefficients A, B, and C to get an answer out of it. So we're not forcing pupils at the moment to actually memorize it, and the typical exam question will get you to think about how you can actually apply it. Um, the second thing that, that strikes me about the debate between developing the core skills and using the computer, I think it's actually a question of trying to find the best way and the most efficient way of getting pupils up to speed with some of the core skills. So if you look at something like the Khan Academy website, I don't know if people are familiar with that, um, but that's got a fantastic bank of resources in terms of um, lots of maths videos that you can go and see, but it's also got a wonderful route map which takes you to, through to, from, to some from very easy maths to some quite hard maths, and it is drilling core skills. But if you look at that sort of model, I think it's trying to get pupils outside of the classroom to focus on their core skills to hopefully free up more time for the teacher inside the classroom to develop the problem solving and creative skills that we're looking for. Okay, thanks. Let me throw in uh, one that's at perhaps the different end of the spectrum then. Um, I routinely use fast Fourier transforms for, for looking at waveforms and trying to understand signal stuff. I have no idea how it works. Am I the poorer for that? Yes. yes. I looked it up on Wikipedia once and I couldn't be bothered to learn it. <laughs> But it works for me, and I know what it does. Is that, is that actually a problem? You, you think that is? No, not really. <laughs> well, I was playing devil's advocate. Um, certainly, if you wanted to do algorithm development, or you wanted to speed up the fast Fourier transform, that's kind of funny, um, then you would need to know the, the guts. But if you actually understand what it's doing, what the input and the output is, right? you actually understand how to interpret the output, Mm -hmm. then I don't think it's really that critical. I mean, Conrad made the point yesterday that the way that computers do things is radically different than the way a human would do the same thing. I mean, you could calculate the Fourier transform by hand, by doing an integration. That's not the way the computer does it. It's a numerical algorithm. So as long as you understand how to interpret the output, I wouldn't be that concerned that you don't know every detail about the calculation itself. And I wish to comment about two terminological difficulties which we have here. Uh, in this discussion. First of all, I see a wrong distinction between uh, doing mathematics by hand and doing by computer. Mathematics is not done by hand. Mathematics is done by brain. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> uh, secondly, there is an important difference between use of mathematics and uh, doing mathematics. Computers are perfect for using mathematics, and it is important to teach people how to use mathematics. It is okay. I applaud this. However, sitting here for a second day, I still have not found a single suggestion how actually to teach people to do mathematics with the help of computers. And this is something different from just using mathematics. <laughs>